Rob Frankenberry, you are a vocalist, pianist, composer. You are very well known in the Pittsburgh music community. And this is why I would like to talk to you today about the cattle industry. Ah, absolutely. I have many opinions that are entirely hot air, and uh, in fact, enough to sear your, your uh, fillet uh, to perfect well done. Very Actually, good. Actually, not well done, perfect rare. I'm, I'm a rare guy. <laughs> Should I invest is what I want to know. Uh, I have always been envious of, well, musicians, but especially those that are multifaceted. It just, you know, they, every musician like that just strikes me as a savant. You know? Now, if, if you think back to your earliest musical experiences, was it something that came naturally to you, or did you really have to work at it? Yes. Which? Um, uh, both. <laughs> okay. <laughs> both. I mean, you know, it was one of those things, I mean, uh, you know, it's a cliche, but it does sort of have to be more natural than breathing if you're going to make a life out of it. Um, and, and there are many different ways of having uh, music in your life and uh, even for many professional level musicians it's actually a constant struggle to make your living at music but to really have music in your life uh, because, because you can get so caught up with the practicing and, the, and the, the practicing actually what once was a pleasure might become a chore because you're so worried about being able to produce the product um, and there, there's a lot of pressure and of course the schedule is always, is always too tight um, no, for me, I know that there was a time, I didn't start studying the piano until I was about 12, uh, even though I had started asking for lessons apparently before I was three, oh. and I did take myself through the sort of the first piano books, but um, I know there was a time that I couldn't read music, I just can't remember it. Huh. Um, and I do look back at things and wonder how I ever was able to do things. <laughs> it's like, because now I look at a thing and I think, this is hard, I have to practice this. And I played it when I was 15 and I think, how, how did I ever get through that? Well, uh, vocal recitals are a large part of uh, what you do. And you know, I didn't tell you this, but I saw you perform oh dear. a vocal recital. It's Gosh, a lie. This had to be... Oh, around maybe seven, eight years ago. Oh, goodness. No, it was in a... I was a completely different voice type then. It was in a church, and I want to say that you were wearing a cape, although I might be subconsciously combining you with Adam Sandler's Opera oh, Man well, character well, from Saturday, I mean, Night, Saturday Night Live. But, if um, I wasn't, I should have been. Yes. <laughs> um, with all that you do, I mean, is it a challenge to sort of carve a career path when you know you're conducting, you're uh, doing vocal concerts, you're you're playing the piano. Which way do you go? Well, yes, uh, it is challenging and difficult. Conductors with with a conductor, it depends on if you're conducting mostly vocalists or if you're conducting orchestras. Because as an orchestra member, I can tell you that once you put a herd of musicians into a pit, there we become a sort of dip, uh, one creature and we have to be wrangled in a different way than wrangling singers usually involves a lot of a lot of ebullience and telling them how wonderful they are and looking them directly in the eyes and you know wrangling an orchestra means not talking too much and you know you have to know what to say when and then you have to know exactly what moment to sort of pull out the the inner jag off well you know <laughs> that's interesting to know because i think for the job and the technique of a conductor i think to the untrained eye it might appear that somebody's just up there you know waving their arms you know very easily imitated and by the way i have seen some of the great imitators bugs bunny oh, mr I, bean um, one cannot <laughs> but let's talk about argue. the technique of a conductor um, and what makes a good one? Uh, well, probably what makes a, a successful conductor these days, at least, is actually the most important thing is your rehearsal technique. Mm. Because when you get into the performance, I mean, especially if you're fortunate enough to, to be conducting any group anywhere near the, the stratosphere that the Pittsburgh Symphony is in, for example, uh, especially if it's on repertoire that's familiar, you, you know, it's easy to make the orchestra feel like they're there to make you look good. <laughs> and okay. whereas, whereas a big part of my job when I'm conducting, if I'm conducting uh, a 
concert music as opposed to an opera is is really helping the orchestra look good. And what that really means is the, the best thing you can do uh, is give useful feedback. In all of this that, that you do, do you find time to relax? What is relaxing <laughs> for you? I feel like I'm relaxing all the time. Uh, well, I think, that's great. Actually, I think part of the reason that I, that, I, that I do too many things is because I feel convinced that I'm just lazy. And so I do all of these things because if I always have to have something finished, then I don't have time to be lazy. So it's a, it's a smoke screen. You know, I kind of understand what <laughs> of you're course, talking yes, about. I, but you have premiered plenty of works by yes. um, many, many living composers. I think well over 150, is that uh, it? I, uh, you know, I Are think you I wrote count? that down once. I, it depends on, on the size of them, I suppose, because, uh, you know, every year I probably play 20 or 30, like, 5 to 15-minute pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it comes to bigger pieces, like, you know, a, a, a duo for violin and piano, or, or a, you know, um, uh, an opera or something. You can count that in different ways, but I, a big part of my life is in new music that has not been done before. And we do have to specify that these are premieres by the uh, by living composers. Uh, yes. you know, the, the deceased ones really aren't yes. premiering much anymore. Uh, Every once in a while you do find something that was, you know, wrapped around a fish that oh, hasn't yeah. been, been, been performed before. But um, Now, do you feel that composers are appreciated more after their death than during their lifetime? Well, I mean, appreciated is a complicated word. Um, in, in the aesthetic sense, yes. In the personal sense, maybe. <laughs> I mean, you know. Depends, right? I mean, the more you know about Beethoven, the less you appreciate him as a person. It seems like he would have been a pretty awful friend. <laughs> but I want you to know that while you are here and living, that you do not have to die in order to gain my appreciation. Why, thank you, As I'll drink to that. And you know what, Rob, that's probably the <laughs> nicest thing I've ever said to anybody. <laughs> But now, what do we have coming up this summer? You are, oh. um, you do have a position with uh, Opera Theater Summerfest. Yes, yeah? I am the music director for the company, which uh, means that I sort of um, try to be the point person to make sure that orchestra questions are, are answered um, and that parts are, are properly marked and you know, given out. And sometimes there's, there's reorchestration to do, or uh, when we're planning a piece, actually, a lot of times it's, it's the question of how many pieces do we need in the orchestra? Can we make it work with this many? Uh, one year I made a version of Carmen for flamenco guitar, accordion, fiddle, you know, double bass. I bet you that was great, because it it's a lot of that sort of gypsy feel yeah, to it. Yeah, we did it in a black box. That makes sense. So, you know, um, I, I sort of just try to help keep those things on, on track. And, and step in where things need to be done. And that also involves me getting to do a certain amount of conducting. Uh, and this year I will be conducting the premiere, asked about new works, of uh, a piece called A New Kind of Fallout uh, by my dear friends Tammy Ryan, who was just a guest yeah, of yours. Yeah, we just chatted with her. Jilda Lyons, who... Um, got her uh, master's degree at the University of Pittsburgh, and that's when I first met her quite a few years ago. And when we decided we wanted to do something sort of inspired by the life and works of Rachel Carson, uh, Tammy Ryan immediately came to mind, and Jill the Lions came to mind. So we put them together, and we have something really spectacular and exciting. And it's definitely you know one of those lifetime achievements to be involved in the first time out on a piece like this. Yeah. So. You are keeping busy, my friend. <laughs> well, life, like, like, you know. I think you've really found your niche. Do you feel that? I, I do, actually, yes. And I, I, I feel like I wouldn't... I, I like being at this point in life, and I'm looking forward to the thing, because I'm just kind of getting good at things. So, just now? Yeah, just now. I, I've seen the past It's been a sham, years. everything before. Well, pretty much, pretty much. I feel like probably in the past year or so, like, okay, now I can actually call myself a singer, and, you know, I'm starting to play well. So, life is good, but I wouldn't go back to being 25 for anything. Mm -mm. Here's to being old and decrepit. <laughs> oh, you got it. <laughs> and not having to wear 80s fashions. Cheers. Um, because you have a very memorable name. It is, uh, yes. I, I make no money off of the serial, unfortunately. Do, do, do folks bring that up a lot, or am I the only tacky oh, jerk? Oh, no, nobody has ever, you know, <laughs> nobody's ever noticed that before. <laughs> 
Now, I know that when I walked in here, you probably pegged me as a Count Chocula kind of guy, but I have got to tell you, booberry all the way. Uh, yep. And yep, I was the, always a blueberry guy. Too. The flavor and the character too. I mm-hmm. love that character. Do you remember the the ghost with oh, that absolutely sort of rumpled hat and those heavy eyelids? He yeah. kind of looked like a old time bourbon drunk. Yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> Which I think I think I was I was naturally drawn to that. There was a connection. It's an there. Image of myself in the future. <laughs> so the thing is that in different market areas, they have different different. Uh, names of the same product. There's something called Yummy Mummy in part of the Now he was not part of the original no. trio. And somewhere I guarantee you there's a Rob Yummy Mummy that's Abs- gone through absolutely. the same struggle that you absolutely. have. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Which is, you know, the only thing better than great opera is really, really, really disastrous opera. Well, they usually do end in tragedy. (laughs)